Hey you guys, this is Jessica Noam here at Rax Tracks with Reverb for another episode of What's That Sound? Today we are exploring how to get the drum sound you hear in Bold as Love by the Jimi Hendrix Experience. Eddie Kramer engineered it, Mitch Mitchell played drums. It is super phasey, it is wild for the era. Supposedly it made Jimi Hendrix uh, curl up in a ball and start crying. Let's check it out. For our drums, we have a classic maple Ludwig kit, and we used a Ludwig Acrolyte snare. For our cymbals, we used K-Dark Zildjian hi-hats, and then we used a 21-inch K-Sweet Zildjian ride. Okay, so for the basic Hendrix drum sound, there is not a ton of processing going on, right? We're doing a little bit, but most of the sound is in the drums themselves. And probably the biggest thing is just the way that the drummer is hitting the drum. There's not a lot of baffling going on in these drums, yet there's also not a ton of, of ring going on in the, in the snare. That's not an accident, that's because Mitch Mitchell was a masterful player and was able to play in a way that he was um, like rim shotting every hit and it was it was causing uh, like choking the drum in a way that, that did not make excessive ring. He also had a really, really balanced sound. So he wasn't too heavy on the cymbals. He really cracked on his snare in a lot of ways. He was able to make himself sound really, really fantastic in the room. And the, the trick with engineering for that was not to manipulate, it was to capture. And that's exactly what we did today. We used a three mic technique. This is a super well-known popular technique called the Glyn Johns method. It was very popular at the time. It involves two overheads and a kick mic, no snare mic, no tom mics and it really, really naturally captures the drums. For the overheads on this, we used a pair of Neumann U47 clones made by Bill Bradley. They are fantastic sounding microphones. They're obviously like a lot of money to put into your overheads. Um, but that is kind of the, the way to think about these overheads. This is the drum sound, right? It's not, this is the cymbal sound. This is the sound of the entire drum kit. So we better make it count. We better use really full bodied mics that are picking up everything really accurately. The placement of these microphones is really specific. Traditionally, Glenn John's is you put one microphone that is above the snare drum over the hi-hat, but it's, it's mostly right above the snare drum. And you put another one that is over the floor tom looking across the kit. The reason for this placement is they want to capture not only the cymbals, not only the, the, the snare, but you also want to capture a lot of the toms. And so you're kind of trying to be somewhat equidistant between the two toms, right? And if you did two overheads, the rack tom is up here, the floor tom is down here, there'd be a lot more distance, right? So it wouldn't capture the floor tom with as much body as you might want. So you stick it over on the side, stick it across the kit, and it'll kind of capture that whole side of the kit, but also it'll have some proximity to the, to the floor tom, so it'll pick that up and be really robust in, in the sound of the toms. The, the number one rule of doing Glen Johns is you have to be very specific with your face, right? The way that people do this is they measure the distance between the microphone and the snare drum and the other microphone and the snare drum, right? And you want them to be exactly, like by the inch, you want them to be exactly equidistant from each other. From, from, from the snare drum to the two microphones should be exactly the same distance. If it's not, what you end up with is your snare sound gets wider and wider and wider, right? That's not a terrible thing, but especially at the time where lots of times they were summing those drums to mono, right? Or, or, or at least having them kind of closed in, 
it could cause a lot of phase problems and thin out your snare drum, right? So if you can get those perfectly in phase, your snare drum is gonna sit right there in the middle and it's gonna be really, really full bodied, in phase, really punchy, even though you don't have a snare drum microphone. For the kick drum, that is supplemental at this point, right? There is still kick drum coming from our overheads, but to make it a little bit punchier, we're gonna use an RE20 on our kick and help kind of get that, that kick drum to have the amount of low end that we want. So the last step that I did with the basic drum sound here is I wanted to record it onto tape. Obviously at the time, that's what they were doing. It contributed a lot to like the the dynamics of the sound, right? How it was crunching up, and it also had some some um, character that it imparted on on the sound. So I wanted to do that. What I chose to do, which which was fairly accurate for the time, was sum a bunch of microphones down. So rather than keeping everything on on my three tracks, I mixed them and printed them onto a two track tape machine, and only took up two tracks for my drums. It wasn't left or right, I just printed the kick in with it and it was a stereo track that was my drum sound. That is gonna be pretty crucial for our next step, which is phasing the drum. So you'll notice in the back half of this recording that there are some crazy spatial uh, sound effects going on. That is tape flanging that you're hearing. And it was really, really novel at the time, right? This was not a sound that people were familiar with like they are now. The way that you achieve it is you have to take your drum sound, right? Print it onto a stereo set of tracks and you have to record it onto a separate tape machine. You then would take the two tape machines which had the exact same sound recorded onto them and you would rewind them and try to get them synced up where they would start at exactly the same place. That's really hard to do. You would press play on both of them at the same time. Uh, they would probably be a little bit out of time with each other. You would then try to sync them up as they play by turning, either speeding up the reel or by you know, sticking your thumb on the reel and letting it drag a little bit, letting it slow down a little bit. And when you would get close enough where they were playing at almost exactly the same time, what you would get is some comb filtering that would start happening. And this is what people refer to as flanging, right? Is the sound of these two signals that are almost exactly in time with each other, but they're just a little bit off. And you get these phase interactions that causes a sound, right? Certain frequencies get uh, dipped, certain frequencies get added to. If you continue to take that slightly more and more out of time, all of those interactions are gonna change, right? And so you're gonna get this kind of like whistling sound and the sound of all these frequencies kind of changing until you hit a null point and then they're gonna start going in the opposite direction. So as soon as you get to the point where they're exactly together, immediately you're gonna go past that point and they're gonna start going in the other direction. So it's way harder to do this on two tape machines. To make it a little easier for myself today, I recorded the drums onto the tape machine, recorded the sound off a of tape back into Pro Tools, and that was one of my tape machines, was Pro Tools playing the tape sound along with the actual tape machine. Let us know in the comments what other drum sounds you'd like to hear us break down. And if you've been using our sample packs, please link us to uh, how you've been using them or what you've used them on in the comments. And we will see you next time. <laughs>